Surprise, surprise again, everyone. And today we've got Darren Young on the channel. Thanks a lot for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome, man. Honestly, man, I see your videos all the time. I'm a subscriber myself. And guys, you guys are watching. If you guys are a Tesla bull, you guys will definitely love this guy. He, he talks about Tesla all the time on his channel. Tesla and Apple, two great companies. But he goes the extra step forward and he interviews people that have Tesla. So it's a whole different insight onto the Tesla world, on the Tesla um, uh, vehicles. So if you guys want more info on that and to be more, um, I guess, knowledgeable on Tesla and be more confident about your investment. I highly recommend you guys to subscribe to him, card in the corner and link in, his link in the description to go subscribe to him. Very awesome content he puts out. Thank you for the kind words, Meiji. My pleasure, man, my pleasure. So I wanna ask you, man, like um, you started this YouTube channel like about a, a year ago. Um, what motivated yes. you to start this YouTube channel? The story I shared before, and it's not planned at all. About a year and a half ago, I was in an external coaching course. One of the things they make you do is to find your life purpose. Very profound words. Yes. But that's what happens in the world of coaching. You, you find very profound things about yourself. For me, it was to be a lighthouse of economic opportunity for those around me. And the, their follow-up was, okay, how do you bring this to life? Hold yourself accountable. So I said, Hmm. If I was coaching someone one-on-one, -on -one, like I'm having a conversation with you now, now Peiji, how many people am I able to make an impact on? It's not going to be thousands, maybe hundreds in a lifetime. So I say to all the other coaches in the program, I'll start a YouTube channel. I thought that was the end of it. We had a WhatsApp group chat and some of them text me and say, sure, what's the link to your YouTube channel, Darren? I was like, oh shit, now I really have to do something. So that's how I started the channel a year ago. No grand plan, but I'm happy that I actually started. I'm thankful for that. Yeah, we're all happy actually, man. The content you put out, man, it's it's very knowledgeable. It's it's a whole different view of Tesla and other investments that, that you talk about. And uh, we are very happy that you started. But the real question is, man, do you really enjoy doing it? Are you happy? The... Uh, Joy for me, everyone's journey and motivation to, is different. The joy for me is I get to step out of my usual circle of contacts. I meet new people. So in my day job or with my family and friends, it's the same hundred people in my life. The gift of doing this on YouTube is that I'm speaking of you right now, Peiji. We would never have spoken if it wasn't for this YouTube channel. Yeah, that's so true. I've got a chance to travel to Austin. We met... Uh, Farzad, we met uh, Dave Lee, we met Sandy Monroe. We met so many unique and interesting people. And it's not just the famous people, but it's also just common people, people who drive Teslas, people who are Tesla fans, students, people who are Tesla owners, they come up and they have conversations. So the ability to meet new people, not just in Singapore, which is a really small country, has been the greatest gift and motivator for me doing this. I'm not doing this full time. This is some a side hustle that I do because I'm passionate about it. So yeah, it's that's my joy. Yeah, no, I can I can relate to you to that as well. I I also do this on the side and meeting the people like man again like you said if if we never started a YouTube channel you and I would never be able to be here and that's honestly a gift. That's that really is a gift. That's awesome, man. That's honestly awesome. But like, well, this is what you do on the side, right? As a as a hobby. Yes. So what else do you do on the side as a hobby? Between YouTube, which as you know, it's a lot of time commitment. Mm. I'm a father of a six-year-old girl and I've got a day job. Oh, nice. So that takes up vast majority of time. When I do have moments of time, I'm on my PlayStation 5. <laughs> just completed uh, Elden Ring. That was the first game Oof. I played. It was so difficult. It's... I'm normally a kind of ga gamer who plays easy. As some of you know who play Elden Ring, there is no difficulty selection. Man, Elden Ring is I probably died game. like I think I died like 500 times just to complete <laughs> the game. Never died as many times before playing a video game. But I'm very happy that I finally achieved, completed it, got platinum. It's uh it's like one of those things in the bucket list. That's I nice. did it. 
That's nice. Now, honestly, Elder Screen, Elder Scrolls is is a, a Elder Scrolls or Elder Rings. I keep getting those names mixed up. Elden Ring. Elder Ring. Elon yeah. Musk has been playing it as well. He likes the game, dude. Too. It's a it's a hard game. I played it once, and I'm like, I'm not playing anymore. <laughs> No, but that's nice, man. That's nice. Uh, that's a big accomplishment. Finishing the game is is a uh, is a big accomplishment. Now, on your channel, you talk a lot about um, Tesla. I mean, Tesla is is the main um, topic you talk about on your channel. How did you get interested into Tesla? Like, what's your journey with Tesla? How did you first get interested in it? It started more than a decade ago. I've been a fan of Elon Musk since. Just as a fan, liked his approach to try new things being a person who challenges status quo in very traditional industries. Yeah. Actually, all the way back first in finance with PayPal many, many years ago before all of this. Then in cars, cars is a super boring industry without Tesla. None of us, True. most True. Tesla fans don't care that much about cars, especially the investors. So that's how I got into that. And space used to be really interesting. It got really boring around the 90s, the early 2000s. And then SpaceX came about. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it 10 years ago. I, I never invested in Tesla or SpaceX before that. There's no good reason to. I was just procrastinating. I actually never invested properly until two years ago. Yeah. And so I was really late in this journey. So that's, that's how long I've been following it. That's how I got into it. And once I started the YouTube channel, I learned a little bit more about investing, about Tesla as an investment. And that's how that really rolled on to what it is today. And I call it out because a lot of people, they wonder, oh, am I too late coming to this? I think, so I'm not the earliest Tesla investor, I'm far from it, but I'm not the latest one as well. And I think whether it's Tesla or just investing in general, the best time to start was 10 years ago. Second best time is still now. I fully agree with that. We yeah. have time. No, that's 100% true. And and um, you mentioned that uh, we're a little late. I think if we look at 10 years from now, I think we're going to look like very early Tesla investors. <laughs> yeah. And you think about it, like late's relative. If you invested in Apple after Steve Jobs passed away, most people will say that's way too late. That's the wrong time to invest. Okay. But your investment will be up 14 times. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, in times. I tell this, yeah, I tell this to my viewers. I'm like, listen, yes. like, like if like a big one of the big risk factors about about Tesla is and I get this a lot on my comments. They say that Tesla's uh, um, Elon's death. And I'm just like, listen, OK, yes, it'll be a very big loss if that happens. And, you know, we hope it doesn't happen. Knock on wood. Mm -hmm. But. You know, if it does, it's, it's human nature. Things can happen. And if it does happen, it's not like Tesla's going to go down. It's they have a plan. They have a role plan. And just like he said, I think it was yesterday's shareholder meeting. You know, even without yes. him, Tesla's going to do fantastic. It's going to do well. It's a roadmap. So yes, I, it's just it's just um, it's easier to be negative rather than to look positive. You know what I mean? I agree. Yeah. So yeah, that that's that that's one thing that I wanted to point out. Now on your on your channel, you uh, have a goal to hit 1,000 shares of Tesla, and I believe it's also 1,000 shares of Apple, correct? That's the dream, yes. Oh, man. That's, 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 a, that's a very heavy goal, but um, I believe for your um, Tesla shares, you're at, I, you said 600 last time I saw your video, like 625? 630 Tesla stock right now at an average cost price of 630. 613. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's nice. Like, listen, I'm going, I'm going all in into Tesla and I don't even have one third of what you have. I mean, that's just insane. <laughs> that's nice. So that's also another thing, right? It, uh, everyone's journey is different and it's all relative. Because if you look at how many Tesla stock Dave Lee has or Chicken Genius has or, or yeah, that, Stephen Mark Ryan has, oh, man. it's, it's 5,000 and above. Then, but the whole point of investing is not to be richer or better than somebody else. It's not a competition. 100%. Help all of us grow. Are we better off today than we were the day before for long-term investors five years ago? And I think that's the, the comparison robs happiness. Because for some people, we tell them, oh, they please Tesla average cost price now is $6 pre-split. Post-split, it'll be $2. Mm -hmm. And some people just get really upset. And it's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't invest in Tesla anymore. <laughs> I get that. I get that too.
but you have to be forward looking, you know, like, yes, yes. This, this is what happened. Like, but, but you, but you also have to understand they've endured a lot of pain. Like if they invested back in, um, as soon as they IPO till before it popped off in 2019, majority of time it was flat. Like you didn't make any money at all. So mm -hmm. that was the pain that they had to endure. They just had to believe it. And that was the risk they took and they got the reward for it. And so, you know, you just got to be forward thinking from now on and to see that, okay, if you think by 2030, if the stock price, if you believe is going to be like 10,000 per share or 8,000 per share, then it doesn't matter if you buy it at $1,000, $800, $1,200 today, because it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's a 10 X from here. And that's why I tell, and that's why I try, try to tell my viewers as well. I'm like, listen, investing, especially in a company like Tesla, extreme volatility, you're going to get one day, the stock price is up 20%, then it crashes down to 30%. This is a long term a long-term uh, investment goal. And so that's the one thing that I try to tell my viewers that, you know, just because one, one guy has more shares than you, it doesn't mean it's too late to invest. In fact, uh, most likely it should be a good reason why you should invest. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Agreed. yeah, thanks for sharing that. That was nice. But how far are you in your Apple um, 1000 share goal? Well, let, let me just take a look right now. So yeah. I've got... 625 Apple stock. My average cost price, because I've been dollar cost averaging on it recently. Yeah, yeah. My average cost price is $144 on Apple. Wow, that's that's oh that's good. Uh, that, that that's that's yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Again, Apple Apple is a is a is a company that's that's also gonna do well long term. I, I don't like the fact that a lot of um heavy, heavy Tesla bulls are like, no, Tesla's gonna go I mean Apple's gonna go bankrupt because of Tesla. I mean that's not true. I'm and life is not binary. So there are a lot of uh, Tesla investors, they're all in Tesla. All in means different things. If you really qualify, a lot of Tesla bulls who are like all in on Tesla stock, they've got multiple property, other businesses, YouTube income streams. There's a lot more going on than this. Very few people have literally all in Tesla. So that's also something to qualify. <laughs> No, yeah, it's definitely important to um, definitely not 100% go all in. I mean, obviously, my majority of my stock portfolio is all in in stock in Tesla stock because I just can't find any other good investment to put in that can give yes. you a high uh, growth in return. But obviously, you would have like properties on the side. You would, you know, save up for um, a house or have, you know, as you said, YouTube income streams and different income streams as well. That's really important. So... You know, you get, you got to pay bills. You got to pay rent. You know, you, you're living on a daily. You're not living in 10 years from now. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Well, that's a solid point. That's an extremely solid point. Now, since you are a Tesla bull yourself, and we both love Tesla, what is your bear base and bull case uh, stock price for Tesla by 2030? Base case for stock price by 2030 will be 10,000. Okay. The bear case will be... 3,000. Whoa, okay. And bull case. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about those scenarios later. Okay. Uh, a bull case would be 20,000. Okay, so let's let's break this down into where these scenarios are coming for me, from my perspective. The worst case scenario, the biggest threat to Tesla. So in today's uh, annual shareholder meeting, Elon Musk has said, Tesla's long-term competitive advantage is not EVs, it's not self-driving cars, it's manufacturing. It's manufacturing. So even when Elon passes, Tesla's manufacturing competitive advantage is going to stay there for a very long time. Unless the plant manager for Gigafactory Texas decides to give the keys to Volkswagen. Unless that happens, Tesla's going to be in a good shape for a long time. So because manufacturing is such a big competitive advantage, today, half of their global volumes come from one factory in Asia, Gigafactory Shanghai. Even a shareholders meeting says no other factories will come close to Giga Shanghai in production. Maybe Austin in a few years from now because we've got so much land around it to expand. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. How about you have seen the visual where you can actually build like at least four Giga factories where the current Austin think, Giga factory stands. I, I think they have 810 hectares land. I think that's the land so it's, size. It's a lot of space. It's a lot. And as we know in this industry, China is a, it's a big call out. Even in the shareholders Q&A, it's a lot wiser that Elon didn't answer how you can deal with the risk between China and US. However, as, as investors, as commentators, 
we can and we should talk about it. It's important yes. uh, for us to know. Well, we're not Elon Musk, so we're not in the same position of responsibility, thankfully. So on that, imagine if things escalate, or even if things don't escalate, let's say there's no geopolitical tension. It's just local policies, local regulation. If the government wants to protect the local industry, they want to protect their own security, even if relations with the US are amazing, even if that's amazing. Because as you've seen, if you talk to friends who are uh, Chinese stock market investors, the government can change things anytime. Regulation, okay. Kids below 18 years old can only play one hour of games per day. Or private tuition is gone. Or and financial IPO not happening. This can happen within a day. Yep. You'll never see that in the US, for instance. So as a consequence of that, let's say, for instance, Tesla becomes very strong. The, the government may decide, okay, we need to protect the local car companies, the BYDs, the NEOs, and make sure that they've got priority in raw material access, which we all know is very important. Yeah. Or what if they nationalize the factory? So that's yeah. the worst case scenario. That's the bear case scenario. If, like, if, if you assume that you just delete the entire of Tesla China, that there's no gigafactory Shanghai, that's my bad case scenario. And that everything that, ha- that was created in Giga Shanghai, basically that it's a technology transfer to most of the Chinese car companies. That's a bad case uh, scenario. Yeah. So that's why I put it as a 3,000 stock because it does, it would set Tesla's competitive advantage in manufacturing, which Elon called out, in a more level playing field, especially with the Chinese car manufacturers. Wow. That, that, that's, that's, ab- that, you know what, that's a solid point. And that's one of the things that not keeps me up at night, but really makes me wonder. I'm like, is it a good idea to like keep expanding in China? I mean, I, it's a, it's a big EV market, but you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot of risks. It's an extremely a lot of risks. Like I can sleep and think, okay, Berlin, Austin, and yes. other factories that they're going to make in other parts of the world. But China, man, China is, uh, Oh, it's it's a, it's a whole different risk, but um, it's a necessary risk for most business, unless you're like Palantir, where you decide like Alex Top, I'm not doing business there. They've made a decision. For Apple, for Tesla, it's both an important source of R and D production and consumers. That's true. And as we all know, Tesla over time, they're building they're building more gigafactories across the world: Mexico, Canada, East Coast, US, maybe Thailand, maybe South Korea, UK. So as that happens, the concentration risk on China goes down. Yes. But again, Tesla's competitive advantage is not the the raw materials or the mass production. It's the manufacturing technology. You don't need to have a lot inside in China for that to be taken away if a worst case scenario happens. So that's my bad case. Wow. Base case, status quo in the world. Say this corner, well, if we just let the current numbers play out, we all can see it already. Yeah. Even today in 2022, the margins are record high, cash flow is record strong, uh, the growth rate is solid. You will just play out the current numbers even if you do a 50% discount on growth rate. Let's say Tesla only grows 50% in the next three years, after that 25% per year. Yeah. Even then, yes. even yes. then, almost every other major car manufacturer is declining. So because they are declining, even if Tesla just grows 25%, the actual relative growth is much more significant. It's enormous. With a cash flow, it's a virtual cycle. You invest more in Tesla insurance, in R&D, in robots, and on and on. Yeah. The And base case, assume that full self-driving does not work. Robots are a nice side project. That's just base case. That's just a good manufacturing business in automotive. Yeah. It's just ridiculously profitable. And all the adjacent automotive related things like insurance or autopilot. And then the, the bull case, most of the dreams come true. Not all. I think they can afford one or two major misses and still hit pretty good bull case. Like even if robots don't work out at all and an autonomous driving fully pans out, even if it takes two more years, that's 20,000. Because our relationship with cars changes so much. Yeah. Our relationship with cars change so much. We're not thinking about the labor of driving anymore. We're not thinking about ownership anymore. Very few companies can afford that pivot in an industry like Tesla. 
or SpaceX or any of past companies. No, that's true, and that's true, and that was those explanations were honestly awesome. Um, the the uh, I I never really thought about the um, the risk part you talked. I mean, I thought about it, but like you, the way you went deep into it, and you mentioned manufacturing is the main thing. Wow, uh, I learned that. Thank you, thank you for that. That was that was actually pretty awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> But um, yeah, um, even even with all that happening, you still give it a stock price of three thousand, and that's like the worst case scenario. I mean, that's like a three x from now. That's still very good. <laughs> yes, because even a worst case scenario, because the, the way the world is structured, Chinese car companies they don't have unlimited access to all markets. They may uh, not be as welcome to Western Europe and US, for instance. It may take some time. It's not like the Korean car companies, where no one has a problem buying. But- Hyundai or Kia, but there may be more you know, uh, barriers for Chinese car brands to get into US and Western Europe. Yeah. That, so because of that, Tesla will still have a strong base no matter what, even in a worst case scenario. Wow. No, that was that was that was spot on, man. That was really nice. Um, I totally agree with what you said. I, it was kind of an eye opener, and I think some of my viewers really appreciate that answer that you gave. Thank you so much. Now, okay. moving on to the next one. Um, you interviewed a lot of Tesla owners in Singapore, like crazy amount of like, I, I think, I think every single Tesla vehicle in Singapore, you've pretty much interviewed at this point, <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. You know, you give very good insights. You, you, you get their opinions, um, what they like about it, what they don't like about it. It's, it's, it's very healthy for Tesla investors to hear that. But what's one thing yeah. that they all say they love about the car? The number one thing, the most consistent thing is they feel like they're driving the future. Oh, okay. They're driving the future. So there was one tagline, it's driving the future. And all different videos just expand on different elements of why it's driving the future. It's the safest car out there. That's the software helps me feel a lot more comfortable. Sentry mode, sentry mode means while well, Singapore is a very low crime country, there is still bullying and harassment. Right. All of that's captured on the camera. Or people trying to key your car, all that's captured on camera. It feels like it's driving the future because it looks like a Star Trek cabin. It's just clean. It feels like driving the, the future because it's a it's a car, it's a company that can afford to have fun, have memes, have Easter eggs in the cars. <laughs> it feels like driving the future because you're using, you call, you're doing so much of your car on an app. You yeah. could even tell a car to stop from an app or just monitor location from the app. Yeah, so... That's my biggest and most consistent takeaway with drivers I meet. Not just in Singapore, but around the world. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Have you have you interviewed anyone that has like FSD in Singapore or is that not available there yet? FSD is available in Singapore, but it's very different from what we have in North America, especially in the US. Okay. So a lot of it don't, don't work. And as you've seen the data from, I think, Troy, Tesla, like a few others, the FSD adoption in Asia Pacific is in the low single digits, like two, three percent. Hmm. Tesla can't officially say this, but for the people in community, the biggest challenge now is the, the relative value add to pay 12,000 Singapore dollars or 10,000 US dollars. It's not yet worth it. It's not yet worth it, not because FSD isn't great, but a lot of the, what makes FSD amazing, especially in US, is not here in a, most of Asia Pacific uh, yet. Okay. And we're not even talking about FSD beta, just normal FSD features. It's not fully available in most Asia Pacific markets oh, yet. Yet. So actually that creates a lot of perception, self tensions and perception. If you've never tried a Tesla in US, you think that FSD is is a hype, it's a joke, <laughs> it's a way to scam people's money. You can't transfer FSD from, from one owner's account to another, it follows a car. When you try to resell your car in many Asia Pacific markets, no one's willing to pay a premium just because you have FSD in it. Oh. They don't care. Yeah. And that so, makes sense. That makes sense. The root cause of it is the magic of FSD, it's not yet here in Asia Pacific. So I always tell Tesla owners if you're traveling the US, rent a Tesla with FSD on Turo. They try it, they come back and say, Whoa, <laughs> I believe now. I'm a believer now. And that's just normal FSD. When they try FSD beta, it's like, I don't know, they're like hooked on a new drug and they can't get back. <laughs> it's really good. So I, I was very fortunate to, to try FSD beta with Tesla Joy in LA a couple of months okay. ago, earlier this year. 
with yeah, my yeah, wife. Yeah, I saw that video. Uh, so that was mind blowing. We don't have that yet. And that's actually a big pain point for many Tesla owners in Asia Pacific mm. to, to give parity and access. And actually, especially with Tesla in China, so there was a there were some surveys done by companies and research firms. When you ask, say, people in North America, how much do you trust are willing to try self-driving cars? 30% of people said yes. In China, you ask the same question, 80% of people say, let's try it. Wow. So the willingness to adopt technology is very high in parts of Asia Pacific. I think, if anything, uh, it's opportunity to launch it. The potential risk of doing that is, again, technology transfer or, or just other companies yeah. reverse engineering it. It's had, there, there have been some allegations in the past where some car companies have reverse engineered the early autopilot or full self-driving of Tesla. So oh, wow. you notice that the pace of software updates in some Asia Pacific markets is not always the same as the US. Wow, but eventually, in, in, uh, you, would, you would think that in the next five years or so, um, that should become available in in yes yeah it's wrong so yeah I think I think I think we'll see a big boom there in in Tesla and you know speaking of 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 the boom uh, in Tesla vehicles um how is the market in Tesla in in Singapore is it slowly growing or like like how is the EV in general actually EVs were almost like a fairy tale in Singapore so if you reverse <laughs> the plot two years ago in 2020 there were only 41 Teslas in the whole country. 41. Wow. That's like one small suburb in, in LA, maybe. <laughs> one street in LA. One street. Not even a suburb. <laughs> one street. 41 Teslas. So that was uh, in end 2020. The EV adoption in Singapore back then was 0.3%. You've probably seen the news a couple of years ago. The government's perception of view on Tesla and EVs were not the same as they are today. So there wasn't as much support yet. So it's changed a lot recently. Yeah. So we went from 0.3% EV adoption two years ago to right now, year to date, 9% EV adoption. Wow, triple. And we went from 41 Teslas to right now, 1,280 Teslas. Wow. So it's very rapid growth on a very, very small base. The base is basically zero, almost zero. <laughs> but it's going to compound. However, right? it's, it's going to compound. And I think some people were saying they believe that once AV adoption, it crosses 5% in a country, it's a point of no return. Really? So Singapore hit the point of no return to me already. The, the way I see it, so the, the government has already said they're phrasing out sales of new ICE cars by 2030. Okay. But because drivers are very practical, you're not going to be caught buying an ICE car in 2029. Who's, what's your resale value going to be? <laughs> so it's very likely that it will hit like Norway levels, like 80, 90% EV adoption, probably by 2028. Yeah. It's only six years away. It sounds pretty crazy. It's hard to imagine. But all around the world, not just in Singapore, people have underestimated EV adoption consistently, even the experts. Wow. Is there is there like the ecosystem of superchargers there in Singapore? We are thankful we, we do. So we went from zero superchargers just 12 months ago, zero 12 months ago, to we're opening a 10 supercharger station. Our, our stations are quite small. They're not like US. We only have uh, three charging lots. Okay. So 10 times three, we have 30 total lots. That's still very little, but it's again gone from zero. Yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah, zero. Don't just share that. They're going to they're gonna double the number of superchargers every year. That's, that's amazing. And if you do a benchmark, for instance, Hong Kong has around, I think, about 100 to 120 supercharger lots, maybe about 32 supercharger stations. So Hong Kong's population is about, I think, 9 million. Singapore is about 6 million. Oh, small wow. island nations, so, uh, small island locations as well. So yeah, if you, you look at Hong Kong as a benchmark, I think Singapore has a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> I'm happy that it's growing fast. Did I wish that all of this came years earlier? Yes. Of course. Some people's if you have friends who visit Singapore, people will say like Singapore is like the Wakanda of the world. Wow. Like things are really clean. It's really modern. It's really advanced. The government plans 10, 20 years in advance. But EV adoption has been one of those things that I feel that the, the ball dropped initially and they're catching up very quickly now. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't really blame them because 
uh, personally myself, um, when when the first Tesla came out the first few years, I was like, EVs, really? Do we really think? But but things have changed now, and I think everyone in the world now are thinking that okay, we're going down this route now, and uh, we should have invested five years ago, but because we didn't believe in it, we can start today. And I think I think that's what's happening. Yes. So that's that, and you know, it's 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 crazy. Um, I'm in Kuwait at the moment at the recording of this video. Yes. I'll, I'll be traveling in in Canada in about in about a week. There's barely any Teslas here, like hmm. like like I see I see one Teslas every four weeks, maybe three weeks, and you, huh. you can't blame them because the ecosystem is not here. They don't have the uh, superchargers here, and Kuwait is a very very small country. Like you could get a car and drive an hour and a half and you've gone through the whole country. It's very small. Mm. It's extremely small, but, but it's an oil rich country as well. And so I think they feel jeopardize if they do bring the EV market here. Um, opposite in Dubai though. I don't know if you've been in Dubai before or not, but Dubai man, not yet. Not yet. it's, it's like. 30% EV, superchargers everywhere. And, they, and they're going hard on robo-taxis there. It's, it's crazy. You can rent out Teslas left, right, and et cetera. It, it's madness. There's so much Teslas there that I'm just like, wow, look at this. They, they even have a showroom there. It's like, wow, you look, you look at Dubai and then, and then you look at like Kuwait, who's like an hour north of, of, of UAE. And it's like, yeah. this, this, they, they still rely on gas cars and like, they still like, an EV here, people that buy EVs here, they end up selling it in the next four weeks or so because like they can only charge it at home. You can't go too far from it, from, from mm. if you want to go to a desert or go tenting or, or you know, camping or whatever, you, you can't because those are really mm. far and you need a gas station for those. So they end up selling it and it's like, come on, like, you know, make superchargers, man. Like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> but... Uh a lot of this is not that Tesla doesn't want to be there. It's that the government needs to be open and receptive to it. Yes. Look at, look at Norway. Norway is one of the world's large oil yeah. exporters. And this is when all in EVs. Yeah. And again, most of the money comes from oil exports. Yeah. But the Kuwait is 100% reliant on oil exports. If that stops, yeah, it, it really jeopardizes everything because Kuwait has nothing else to export. It's an import driven yeah. economy. The only thing that goes out is oil. And if that gets jeopardized, um, I don't know if you know this, but the most strongest currency in the world is the Kuwaiti dinar. One Kuwaiti dinar is three dollars and thirty three cents. Wow. It's the strongest. I didn't know that. Yeah, that is the strongest because of the oil. That's what it is. And if the oil runs out and maybe maybe in 20 30 40 years if the whole world hasn't turned to ev or you know solar panels or renewable energy that quit is in big trouble because they're not even making any investments in solar panels or clean energy like it has all this sun like honestly mm -hmm. living in Kuwait during the summertime is like living in a simulation because it's sunny every day it's the same thing every day and you would you would think that they would want to make you know solar panels in the desert so they can capture all that sun but they don't do yes. that. It's not even it's not even productive land if it's a desert. You can't you can't farm crops there, yes. Exactly. They don't even do that. It's 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 mind blowing it. mind boggling to me. But the exact opposite in Dubai. If you go to deserts in Dubai, man, you could see mega megawatts of solar panels just lined up across the desert. They say at nighttime, the city of Dubai gets the power from the solar panels generated by the sun. Wow. Not from the oil or anything. So it's just it's, it's it's the way to think here is it's incredibly hilarious but the, but in canada in toronto where i'm from it's 20 percent all evs already gas stations are mm. now putting ev chargers so you have you have mm. your gas stations and you have your ev chargers so you know what's interesting uh PG, is that i've got some friends who are like big tesla fans they invest in tesla but they also invest in oil companies and here's why mm. because evs are not uh accidental threat to oil companies. Elon has said, we need oil. Yes. Even if the whole world is EVs. You need oil and plastics to produce EVs. Yep. You need oil and plastics for everything, for your iPhone, for your water bottle. Everything. It's not going away. The whole world can have EVs and we'll still need oil yep. and gas. Yep. But guess what? Many companies are not investing in building capacity. 
So yeah. if you have current pro uh, production, your current capacity, that's going to be even more valuable over time. Yep. It's a sunset market, but it's going to be more valuable over time. So I don't see it as binary between EVs and oil and gas. I think oil and gas can fund and build, co-create the future. Yes. It's going to be, it's not going to be 0%. The world's not going to be 0% oil and gas consumption and never, even 100 years from now. Yeah. We still rely on it. However, we will use a lot more solar, as Elon has mentioned. We will use electric vehicles, not just in cars, but we even boats and planes eventually as mm. we improve battery technology, as we improve the, reduce the weight of batteries and the cost of batteries. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think everything is always like binary, like it's black or white or it's yes or no. Both can play a part. Yeah, it's yeah. just playing different. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you there. It's, it's just a waste. Um, and I've always thought this when I was a kid. I'm like, it's such a waste to put gas in a car and then it just gets like, evaporated in the air but while we can use that to make other things with it that's that was uh, always my mentality when it came to like you know gas station it's like wow you just put it in and then you fill it like isn't there a better way <laughs> well here comes tesla <laughs> first elon says right this thing with first principles like if you got all this oil and gas reserves what's our best use of this asset yes how can i put this to most productive use not just to make money but for a more sustainable future to build a country, to help our citizens have a brighter future, a future to look forward to. Yes, yes. No, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Talking about Tesla, do you own a Tesla vehicle yourself? Not yet. Oh, so that's a a pain point. Especially as you, if you talk to your friends in Singapore, we have the world's most expensive cars by design. Yeah, you showed that by in a video. Design because of the vehicle taxes. Jesus, I agree. Jesus. The government's policy. They're trying to create a car light society. They're trying to con manage the population of cars so that the driving experience is smooth. It doesn't have too much impact on our infrastructure. So the, I think the policy broadly works. And public transportation here is really good. It's world-class. It's one of the best in the world. Nice. It's not like asking you to take public transport in, say, in the Midwest. It's a very different experience. So because of that, cars are a nice to have. I haven't been driving... I have got a chance to at least uh, sit in a lot of Teslas, thankfully. Uh, but have you driven I've got a Singapore driver. I've got a Singapore driver's license now, so I've got a chance to just take some Teslas around. Uh, nice. Friends give me a chance, chance to experience it. We don't have that many models in Singapore yet, as you some of you may have seen. We only officially have the Model 3. The Model S and X were the pre-refreshed ones from Peril Imports okay. before Tesla officially came to Singapore. So the parallel imports have stopped because Tesla Singapore has said, if you buy a parallel import car right now, KG, we will not support you on servicing software and maintenance. Oh. So if you parallel import it from UK, you send it back to UK yourself and take care of it yourself. Why? Wow. So because, <laughs> yeah, so again, business decisions. And as you know, many countries have been asking for SNX, the refresh one. But I think it's going to take a few years before it comes to Singapore. In Singapore, it's is this tiny red dot? It is 6 million people, 650,000 cars. It is nowhere in anyone's list of priorities of <laughs> let's win this market. That is why a place in Singapore with very few natural resources, Singaporeans call it the little red dot. Mm. Uh, it's got a punch above its weight in different ways, like Singapore Airlines. Yeah. The whole world knows Singapore Airlines because it said, we, if we exist, we have to be the best. Otherwise, yeah. we have no reason to exist. It's one of the best airlines. And you also see some countries in the Middle East, like, like uh, Dubai, doing the same thing as well, having a similar philosophy. Emirates. Like, yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, Singapore Airlines, Emirates. Emirates, recently, they're not doing really well. I've, I flew with them recently. But Qatar, uh, Singapore, very nice. Very nice. Very nice airlines. Um, but uh, in, in terms of um, um, you getting a, a Tesla vehicle, what model would it be if you would choose? It would be a Model Y. So get yeah, I qualified it. There's no, there's no Model S and X for us to buy in Singapore in the near future. So the options are Model 3 and Model Y. I've got a young daughter. So for families, mm. Model Y is a better choice. It just has so much more trunk and trunk space. Wow. Four times more. Four times more. And 
again, it rides higher. Uh, my wife and I like that. It's more comfortable getting in and out as well. So yeah, it so would be the Model Y. The Model Y. The Model Y as a benchmark for international audience. It would be, if you just get the rear wheel drive, let me just do a quick calculation right now. Yeah, no problem, man. Rear wheel drive would be 180,000 US dollars all in and performance would be 217,000 US dollars. It's insane. That is three times the price in the US, three times. That's so if I ask you to pay 217,000 US dollars for performance model Y, you'd be, I could buy a most supercars in the US. That's, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Wait, so isn't it cheaper for you than to like buy the car in the US and ship it to Singapore or buy it in China and ship it to Singapore. No, it's not cheaper that way, if that's the case. The government won't allow that. So all these wow. all these loopholes are buying overseas, you can't you you can't do that. You still have to pay the local taxes. Jesus, man, that's 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 crazy. Triple the amount of the wow. Yeah, so for those of you watching, have empathy to why it's so hard for us to buy a Tesla vehicle in Singapore especially for those of us who are Tesla investors. We know the opportunity cost. Yeah. There yeah. were some people who did think the reverse calculation. Like if you put in the down payment for those first 25 Tesla Roadsters, the one announced, I think, four, four years ago, I think you put in the down payment of three, 400,000. That's worth about three, three million right now. It's insane. <laughs> so like, the people who are putting the down payment for the Roadsters back then, they probably had millions to begin with. That's not a problem yeah. for them. Yeah, but the point is, opportunity cost is uh, it's very high. We know that we are in a cast of all these S curves, as Dave Lee mentioned, robotics, yes. autonomy. Oh, that's crazy. I'm still shocked about that three times the cost. That's that's just that's that's crazy, man. That's absolutely crazy. <laughs> now, um, m moving on, the uh, I saw one of your videos. Um, this is talking about the FSD part. It was a video of you in a boat with your family. And um, you were doing a comparison with Tesla and sites in Singapore, which I thought it was a very unique video. It was a really nice video. Um, and you mentioned that um, when your daughter grows up, um, and she's very cute, by the way, I just have to point, point that out. <laughs> Thank you. When, when, she, when she becomes older, she doesn't need a driver's license to drive anymore. Like, do you, like this part, I, I want you to expand on this part because I never thought about yeah. it this way before. Mm. I think think about it like if you want to ride a, a horse as a passion, then you, you go and train yourself. In the future, as cars drive themselves, the analogy is Elon was sharing the shareholders meeting. In the past, you used to have somebody in the lift to man the lift for you. What level do you want to go to? Level five? They click a button, they crank the lift, it goes up level five. Now it's purely automated. Mm. So in the future, like for 98 99% of use cases, you wouldn't want to drive. It's just a chore. It's a burden. Yeah. You may want to choose to manually drive, like let's say in the autobahn or you're going to drive in a beautiful like, seaside route. Maybe you want to do it as a recreation. As a recreation. So I think our relationship with cars is going to be very profoundly different. 10, 20 years from now, when our kids look back at us, they'll be wondering, that's so backward to drive your car. You mean you spend <laughs> six hours on a steering wheel on a road trip? That's what you do? People are going to look back at that and say that is pretty insane. That's like, that is like using a Dalat modem right now, for instance. We look back at yeah. that and say, how could we have survived on that? Yeah. How did we do it? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. That's a good point of, of the kids looking back 20 years, 20 years from now, in 20 years, going like, wow, you actually drove. That's actually, I never thought about it that way, actually. That's, that's pretty interesting. Wow. I mean, but I, I, would, I, would, I would still think that one would still need to have some sort of a level of, of a license to like, um, because like occasionally if they would want to drive, I, I would think yeah. that one would need maybe not as strict as a driver's license, but like maybe something lower. So that you're qualified to, you know, take care of the car if it if you decide to take take over. Yeah, you probably need to read like an owner's manual when you get a car in the future. Like these are the safety features. Yeah. Click this button or call that to do a manual override. And yeah. I think the whole the technology just advances that our relationship changes. So I'll give you another example. 
say 30, 20, 30 years ago, if you needed to find what's the capital of Sweden and you didn't know the answer, you had okay. to go get an encyclopedia or go to the library. You go to the library, you need a library card, borrow the book, find out the answer. Now you just pick up your phone. You don't need any training. Anyone in the world yeah. picks it up, does it. Wow. So, so same thing with self-driving cars. It's just the, the barriers to use, the barriers to safety is just going to go down a lot. Wow, I've, I've never actually thought about it that way. Wow, that's actually pretty, it, it, a very logical way to look at it, you know? Now imagine if that happens to vehicles and it, the software gets so nice, you can add that to like planes, to boats. Yeah. Could you imagine yeah. going on an airplane and there's no pilots like that? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the pilots will tell you actually, apart from takeoff and landing. Yeah, it's autopilot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that's where autopilot came from, from the aviation industry. They're there to make sure that there's a fail safe, there's a manual override. Wow. No, that... Because it's not just your lives at stake, it's two, 300 passengers' lives at stake. Makes sense. Two pilots yeah. to take care of two, 300 lives. Okay. But one pilot to take care of your own, your own self in a car, that's, that's probably going to be history. I yeah. say in many cities, not everywhere, but in many cities within 10 years. And actually, I believe that cities in China will be the first ones where you really see mass adoption of wow. autonomous vehicles. Yeah, that then then you would read a, then you would like think about the movie uh, that they made twenty years ago called iRobots, You know, <laughs> iRobot, Minority Report. Yeah, Jaden looks into the future, and then you would you know you look at back, it's like whoa, we're 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 pretty much almost there. You know, like <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> That, that's 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 insane thank you for sharing that point of view uh, that 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 was very valuable um uh, that was awesome that was really awesome now um as you know um we are technically in a recession mm -hmm. right um uh, how would you like how would tesla perform in a recession in your opinion a lot of my viewers and my comments yeah. they go like oh we're in a recession no one's gonna buy you know sixty thousand dollar car when there's a 30,000 car vehicle, you know, uh, that you can get. So like, I want to know your opinion on like, uh, your opinion on Tesla in a recession. Okay. My opinion is shaped by this context. Tesla has less than 3% market share globally. Less than 3% market mm -hmm. share globally. If they had 90% market share, my answer would be very different. That's true. Because they have less than 3% market share, the people who are buying $60,000 Teslas are probably owning $70,000, $80,000 cars or other $60,000 $60, ICE cars that they know uh, they're paying petrol for, they're paying an inconvenience for. And Elon has said himself that he does feel in the recent podcast that the, the price of Teslas is not where they want it to be in a grand yeah. plan. They do want to bring it down. There are many ways to bring it down, either by launching a cheaper model or by again, solving autonomy. So to me, in a recession, Tesla actually right now is going to be even stronger. When times are very tough, only the strongest survive, only the best survive. So if you your money is so precious that you need a car, you want to decide between buying a Ford, a GM, a Tesla, the decision is going to be actually easier towards Tesla. Because now I can't buy the nicer halves. I can't buy it because I like the looks. I need to buy it because it is a good car. It is safe because I cannot afford, especially in US, I can't afford my healthcare bills. I need the car to be safe. So the fact that this is the safest car to drive saves a lot of hidden costs, especially for some of our friends who don't have universal single payer healthcare. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure some of your friends will say like, you're in Canada, just cross the border down and it's an alternate reality <laughs> of healthcare. So that's a whole different topic. But the safety value, not forget about the oil cost, forget about the technology, forget that you like Elon Musk, forget like EV. The fact that it's safer saves you a lot. Yeah. Money and peace of mind. Yeah. There, there, there's a YouTube channel called Wham Bam Tesla. I don't know if, if you watch their... Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, like, Pretty crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you saw this video too. It was the FSD autopilot. It knows when it's about to get into an accident. That blew my mind. I'm like, that's insane. That's just crazy. Like the car knows 
when it's about to get into an accident and it prepares you for it. And that, 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 that was like a big, like, whoa moment for me. I'm just like, imagine what people want to, imagine how many people will want to pay for that. That's, 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 that's insane. So yeah, that, what the safety factor that you mentioned is absolutely spot on. And another thing that I want to add on to your comment is that, um, well, they save a lot of money on gas. Yeah. My friend, he owns a Model 3 in, in Canada, and gas prices there are um, $1.70 per liter at the moment, Canadian. I think that's about mm-hmm. $1.40, $1.50 um, liter uh, US. And everyone that, that, that commutes, they pay about three to $400 a month just on gas, while my friend is only paying $30 in, 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 in to, to fill up the electric every month. And he's like, I'm not complaining, you know, it's, you know I'm, I'm saving a lot. Everyone is complaining. And yeah. so, you know, <laughs> and on top of that, you don't have to pay for services. Like there's no engine and oil to go and, you know, change every five, yes. 10,000 kilometers. So that, the, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, that's things that I wanted to add on to your, um, to your point. Building even further. Electric charging is already uh, affordable. And if you do home charging, if you are fortunate enough to do home charging, it costs the price by another 30 to 50%. Yeah. On top of that, uh, the safety also reduces cost because a big part of car ownership is insurance. You've oh, all seen the stats yeah. like Tesla insurance is really like the first or second largest insurer of Teslas. Yeah. So if you're in a recession, to your earlier point, you want to really reduce your costs. And Tesla, Tesla is saying, with Tesla insurance, we look at how, how well you drive, the safer you drive, the lower your cost will be. At Let's the moment, the how you're doing it yeah. now and at the moment, not on your past history, what happened five years ago. That's yes. that's amazing. You get penalized if you're a young driver because insurance, like for car insurance, if you're young, you get, get paid more. So if you're a young driver, you are starting your career. You don't have that much money. Yep. It's like, why would you not buy Tesla insurance <laughs> over Tesla? Why would you not? Yep. So you see like how in a recession, an innovative, a fast paced company at Tesla becomes even stronger. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I totally agree with you that those were like hard. Those are facts. They're not even points. They're, those are facts. <laughs> no, that's nice. That uh, I believe that too. I believe like um, this recession is only going to strengthen Tesla and it's going to come out even stronger than ever before. The, the only ones that will t- take a big hit are the OEMs. Uh, it's, it's just at this point, that's just what it is. But um, speaking of like um, other vehicles to Tesla, you know, the saying, the competition is coming. Yes. <laughs> what do you think about this? I think we need to direct our gaze. The statement isn't wrong. Like in every industry, the competition is coming, but it's coming when? When is it coming and where is it coming from? So. At this stage, it's fair to say the competition is not coming from GM. No. But you could argue that the competition could be coming from a Hyundai. Yes. Hyundai has the scale. They are an ICE company that has done a lot of good work moving to EVs. Their recent designs have been widely praised. Yeah. The Hyundai Ioniq 5, the Kia EV6 yes. have strong reviews. The user sees that as high as well. Not as high as Tesla, but it's high. Ford still has America's most popular car, the Ford F-150. Their EV version has got good feedback. They need to scale it. They need to scale it dramatically. Their the leadership team was recently in a Sandy Monroe episode. Yeah, yeah I saw that. I saw that, yeah. <laughs> and I think what was very encouraging was they, they demonstrated a very humble, grounded attitude towards yes. respecting the competition and also respecting their need to, to change. And I think the CEO, Jim Farley, was very honest. He said when they first decided to do an EV version of the Ford F-150, people instantly asked, why are we making an EV? And if we do make an EV, if it's less profitable than ICE cars, why are we selling it? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So they had to deal with a lot of internal changes to make it happen. And as Elon has said, the only two American automakers that are not yet bankrupt are Ford and Tesla. So I think there are a few competitions we need to direct our gaze. To me, if I look at the top three it would be right now at at scale 
maybe Hyundai, Ford, some people say Volkswagen, specifically within Volkswagen, Porsche is doing well. Like in Singapore, the, the Porsche Ty Taycan is the top three selling EV. Oh, wow. Actually, three selling EV. actually, here in Kuwait, there's there's a quite a bit of uh, Porsche Taycans as well, surprisingly. And globally, they sold about 40,000 units. So which is way more than Rivian, Lucid, and all those other like yeah. <laughs> EV brand names. Yeah. So there's a lot of nuance in this question. If we point in the right places, Porsche, uh, Hyundai, some of the Chinese car companies, some, some, some people say BYD potentially as well, then yes, there is some competition, but different kind of competition. I feel like um, I, was, I was interviewing uh, Farzad um, earlier and he said um, that by the time that everyone becomes an EV, um, mm -hmm. the next, I mean, by the time everyone, be, the whole market turns to an EV, the FSD will be the next thing. And then everyone is going to try to run after FSD. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. That, that was very interesting when he said that I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't, I, I didn't think about it that way that I didn't think about that. I, that was, that was very interesting. That was very interesting how he said it. I'm like, I didn't think about it that way. That was really cool. So agree. Everyone's going to be chasing first now Tesla and EVs, then Tesla and automation, then later on potentially Tesla and robots. Yeah, the robots. So part. because they are chasing, Tesla gets to, to reap the bulk of the rewards yes. on the premium on innovation, the premium that you're the only option right now that's that good. That's true. Which is very different strategy from Apple. So if you talk about Apple, you know that Apple very very rarely does things first. In fact, they usually last, but they're the first to do it really well. They're the first to make it seamless. Hmm. So I see that's a very different strategy from Tesla. Wow. Hmm. And lately, um, speaking of Apple, lately, they're not really coming up with new products, new innovative product recently. They are working on CarPlay, however. But yeah. other than that, I think, I think they're working on something. They're, they're, they're just not... You know, it's behind the curtain. They're not. They, they're not. They, they want to surprise us with it. I think this is what's yeah. happening because that's what Apple does. So let's see. Let's see. Um, but I wouldn't bet against Apple. Uh, I, I definitely would not bet against Apple. It's just the way how they're running things. They have more cash than many other countries out there. <laughs> I think they. Uh, I was seeing a post on Twitter. They've got about. So Tesla is seventeen billion in cash. Yep. Apple is around one hundred and eighty billion yeah, in cash. That's that's and their their recent innovations are not as obvious as in Steve Jobs days, like an iPhone, a MacBook Air. They're more low key. Ex yeah. uh, one example would be the M1 chips. They are revolutionary. In, oh yeah. In, uh, I don't know anyone who is not using an M1 laptop because once you use it, you will just be insane to not use an M1 laptop either for the battery life, the performance, wow. the no fan sounds. So that's very low key, and that. That the chip is going into iPads and other devices as well. The Tim Cook has said that their ambitions are well, people ask him, what will your greatest legacy be? It's not, it's not all these devices. He said it'll be healthcare. So I think healthcare mm. is a bigger addressable market than automotive. Like that can be solved. And you think about the brands that people trust, Apple is relatively high in yeah, yeah, trust yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. Apple, Apple, Apple is, is solid, is a solid one. Okay, so th that was that was very interesting in, in terms of competition. Now um, what, what are some risks? Um, now, I know we, we talked about it earlier about, um, about Elon, Elon's death, but uh, yeah. what are some other risks that you think that um, could hurt Tesla? Um, I'm not too sure about the long term, but short to the medium term. Short term, Gary Black would say <laughs> like a PR team. <laughs> the stock price. So we need to break it down between the, the company fundamentals and stock price. Let's talk about company's fundamentals. Okay. For company's fundamentals, it's it's, it's just making sure that not just that Elon's alive, but that is he is healthy and able mm -hmm. to give the right focus to make the right impact. It's not about spending seven hours a day on Tesla, but if we decide to spend one hour a day on Tesla, that it's an impactful one hour, and he can only do that when he's healthy and focused. So some people say, please don't be too distracted by Twitter. Yeah. You don't have to single, you don't have to single-handedly repopulate the earth. So people just want him to be 
healthy, happy, and focused. He doesn't need to be full time on Tesla. He's he was never full time on Tesla, like a normal CEO, but he's putting crazy hours, especially in production RAM. Yeah. But people just need him to be just in a good state of mind. That's important. So it's not just death. Like if if someone goes crazy, for instance, it's even worse than death. Yeah, that's true. Yep. It's even worse <laughs> than death. Death is better than someone who actually destroys your own company. Great nations, great companies are destroyed from within, yeah. not from the competition. That's true. Oh, there was some crazy scandal from within that happened that is that cannot be solved. Or a court asked Tesla to shut down for whatever reason. Or there's corporate espionage or some crazy things. that. So I think those wild cards that it's so hard for us to predict would be risk. It's not within our control. This could be happening in every other company as well. I think the thing that's most unique to Tesla is that Elon is one person running so many things. He needs to protect his health, his well-being. And again, with the, the recent political situation, like supporting in Ukraine, they are the assass assassination threats are credible. Yeah, yeah, real. yeah. <laughs> Jim Farley can come to Ukraine and he'll be fine, or even go to UK and be fine. But if, if Elon makes the same trip even to Germany, he's got to be cautious, more cautious than a normal CEO now. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The, um, um, I, I believe, I, I do believe there's, there is some target on him, um, especially from the Russians. But, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, the risks that you just pointed out, I didn't think about those risks. It's like, I, I, I only thought about it in the general aspect, like, okay, Elon's death, yeah. uh, maybe FSD failing, but, um, how you went and said just his health being an important aspect, I didn't think about that. So that was, that was an eye opening aspect too. And I think my viewers will really appreciate that. Um, that was, that was yeah, that was an eye opener. Before this comment that you, that you just said, a lot of a lot of the comments on my YouTube channel, they all bring the excuse of Twitter. And before you made this comment, I was like, I mean, look, he, he does all these companies. If he gets Twitter, it, it's not gonna like take away time from Tesla. Maybe in the short term it will a little bit, but eventually he's gonna get someone else to run it the way he wants it. But then your comment goes like, no, if he, if, he, if he spreads himself too much, then, you know, his health can become an issue. And it's like, huh, okay, I didn't, I didn't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was nice. That was actually a really good point. So it's not, it's not binary, it's not like life and death. It's the shades of gray that yes. we often don't consider. Those are our blind spots. So not that another potential short-term risk that is unique to Tesla is Elon has said multiple times that he's got broader visions for X.com, like a broader holding company. Yeah. If he acts on that, the fundamentals of the company as a making cars, robots, it doesn't change. Yep. But how investors see, see that. Tesla completely changes. And it may become like a SpaceX where suddenly, okay, I need to wait 20 years to see my return on investment. Mm. I, I think that risk is there, but it's lower because... Most Tesla employees you speak to, especially uh, anyone else, stock is very important as part of their total compensation. Yeah. The base salary in Tesla is okay. Stock's really important. So if Elon's going to do something as drastic as folding everything with X.com, yeah. he would probably give hints in advance or at least compensate the employees first. That's true. And because retail investors, like uh, Martin was opening the shareholders meeting today, say, first and foremost, thank you to all our retail investors. So they, they don't want to punish the retail investors as well. They want to do right by them. Yeah. But one of the contrasts there is Elon still has a dream for X.com. And how does everything come together? That's another wild card. Yeah. Well, can, you, can you expand? Like, what is X.com? Like, I just heard about it yesterday. <laughs> so it's, and I may be wrong, but I think it was also like one of the early domains or names for, for PayPal as well. It's almost like, like this mothership of all the ideas to bring like everything uh -huh. Elon's hands out of the place. Because ultimately his, his mission right now is one, to extend life on Earth. Second, to make humanity multiplanetary by going to Mars. Yes. So X.com is one way to fulfill all that umbrella. Huh. Uh, for, for life to succeed and thrive, it also needs a open town hall. That's where something like Twitter comes in. 
You need a boring company because you need tunnels, not just tunnels are not just for Earth. Tunnels are vital and critical for Mars mm. because of the solar radiation. It doesn't have atmosphere. Right. So all these building blocks in Elon's world <laughs> are very important. Robots, Neuralink. When you want to build a Mars colony, you can't have human labor, 50,000 people building a building. It's robots and you're using your mind yeah. to help automate and move robots. Jeez. <laughs> So oh. all these kind of play. And if you don't have enough medical professionals in a Mars colony or a moon colony, Neuralink repairs spinal injuries. It helps your, your mind work even if your body is not working well. So a lot of this is about extension of life, preservation of life, making us multi-planetary. And to me, I think a lot of that will wrap down to X.com. So it's a grand vision. It's really yeah. like those science fiction books like Isaac Asimov. <laughs> But it will be very, it may be too much, especially for institutional investors. Yeah, um, I'm not going to lie. It is, it's, it's, uh, it's too much for me, to be honest. It's like, geez, <laughs> <isn't> it? <laughs> it's like, geez, man, like <laughs> space, you know, Neuralink, yeah. all these things. It's like, geez, man, like. Just, it's the deep end. Yeah. And, and that's why they call Elon a, a, an alien because and it, I don't think any other human on the planet can do what this guy is doing. It's it's incredible. It's incredible what he's doing. I want to th take this as a pivot just to acknowledge that as well. The world doesn't need a thousand Elons. Yeah. One Elon or even a handful of Elon is great. And it's back to all of us as well. All of us are unique in our own ways. We give different gifts. Elon just talked about, about a lot. Just because you've got 100 million Twitter followers, doesn't mean your value or your worth is more than someone else. I think all of us have our own role to play here. And again, Elon has also constantly said that his role can often be overemphasized. There's a lot of great talented people in Tesla and all the other companies as well. They wouldn't be where they are without a lot of these pioneers and great minds. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Totally agree. Wow, that was that was a big dive in 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 the risks and X.com. That was that was awesome. That was absolutely awesome. Now, um, yesterday in the shares holding um, uh, meeting, um, they said that by 2030, they're trying to get a 10 to 12 gigafactories to reach the 20 million uh, vehicles by 2030. Now, the next gigafactories, they didn't they didn't disclose that. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, they didn't announce that. So where do you think the next gigafactories will be at least for the next three years? Okay, so again, this will be excluding any expansion. So just to yeah. call out to everyone watching this, that a lot of the, local, the existing sites, the four existing sites will continue to expand. Giga Shanghai would double in capacity. It's going to be huge. Berlin will expand. Austin will expand. Fremont is expanding. So those alone, those four gear factories will, can double, triple Tesla's capacity today. Yep. So I just want to call it out because it's not binary. It's not just building new sites. Yeah, yeah. Now for new sites, I think about where are the, the major gap coverages. So the EV tax credit in the US, if there's momentum and it really gets closer to passing, Tesla would build another factory then. This will accelerate because the demand would be a crazy factor <laughs> or very much higher. There is still space to continue to support North America demand. So people have been talking about Canada or Mexico factory. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, these places also fall within the EV tax credit if you build it within North America. Oh, wow. Nice. There'll be one place. Southeast Asia, 620 million people. They are still import tariffs. So even though you import from Giga Shanghai, they are still import tariffs. So if you build a Giga factory locally, one location would be Thailand. Why Thailand? It is by far the largest car market in Southeast Asia. A lot of people have been talking about Indonesia yeah. because they've got a lot of raw materials. Lithium. But there's a difference between where you get raw materials and where you build cars. It doesn't always need to be in the same location, even though it's ideal. Uh, Tesla does a lot to localize the supply chain to reduce logistics costs. So some people feel that Gigafactory in a Indonesia may be a possibility. So I would say in Southeast Asia, one Gigafactory, not two, one, okay. either in Thailand or Indonesia. Thailand would be my, my first one, and Indonesia would be a potential second, okay. just because of the proximity to raw materials for batteries. Okay. Then beyond that, we look at North Asia, especially if they want to reduce concentration risk in China, potentially South Korea. Mm. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, South Korea because it's a huge manu- automotive hub. Just like, remember three years ago when Tesla said we are going to build a giga factory in Germany, people were thinking it's insane. You are crazy? <laughs> you want to build it in a German automaker's backyard? You want to deal with all the bureaucracy and regulations to open it? They did it. They made. If they made Germany happen, South Korea, I think it's okay. Yeah, it's not that much of a leap. How about Japan? Then, because Japan has has like you know the Toyotas, the Nissans. Japan, I've learned from friends. I thought about that too. The challenge of Japan is it's not that the car market is small, but the regulations and the way they operate makes it very hard to build a factory. So Elon was saying recently, the time it took to build Giga Austin was less than the time it would take them to get permits to build a building in California. <laughs> it, it, it may feel that way in Japan currently. Wow. And I think the government wants to try to improve things. So there was a, a story, for instance, like when COVID first hit in Japan, a lot of businesses relied on like manual stop, manual stamps to do business. So they, they couldn't continue running the business. They had to bring back the stamps from offices, stamp paper, and give it to their suppliers and contractors. Japan makes sense from a distance, but if we look at the nuances of execution, it seems really, really tough. I would love to be wrong, but right now, South Korea is a much better op- option. Okay, then that makes then, sense. In the, the rest of Europe, many believe UK. UK would be a good automotive hub. I, I've got one more wild card in, in Europe. And if when things recover and things are better, Giga Factory Ukraine may be possible. Oh, here's why. Here's why. This is a country with now the world's largest number of Starlink subscribers. Four hundred thousand users of Starlink. Yeah, and especially after the 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 invasion, it would it ramped yeah. up drastically. So normal people are using it. The military is using it. The Teslas, uh, because of how high they get oil, electric vehicles will be adopted. They are using Tesla solar energy, Tesla solar, the, the power walls to help them because airstrikes on power plants yeah. and state power generators mean that Tesla energy is a lifeblood for them. So you think about a nation that needs to rebuild. If you are to build from the ground up, it's like imagine you had no telco network, the telco towers would be 5G. You have no legacy 2G and 3G. Mm. When you're rebuilding a country, you're going to go for the best option, the best viable technology, the best technology. And on top of that, the people in your country have a lot more, they've seen who supported them in a tough time. So their, their relationship with a Tesla, a SpaceX is going to be very different from normal people in US and Singapore, yeah. South Korea. It's a very different relationship. This is almost like a visceral relationship. Like, and imagine employees in a Giga Factory in, say, Giga Factory Ukraine. Yeah, that imagine would be- a level. Of, they will be pretty insane. Like, like, and imagine what it does to a country to say, like, you know, this model Y made in Ukraine. Yeah, that would that would that would that would definitely um, um, make an impact. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. So that's uh like a crazy wild, wild card option and it won't happen anytime soon but yeah um i think i think says, Wait, love, sorry, i think i think the 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 one the one way that this would happen is that if 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 russia wouldn't be such a big threat <laughs> after everything is done because if it's still going to be there it's still going to continue to bully ukraine unless there's a big change in that country but um Yes. Giga Ukraine would be absolutely symbolic. It would be awesome. And it would impact, I think it would actually help a lot of customers. I mean, a lot of customers are picking Teslas, but this would like help it even more. Like this would go like, wow, look at this. You know, it would, it would make a massive impact. Wow. I, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't think about the Ukraine. Wow. Nice insight, man. That was good. <laughs> well, for cynics, they'll say, oh, you, you do it for the feel good factor. Elon doesn't care about the money or the sales. I think what would motivate Elon would be like, he just wants humanity to work together for the common good. That's true. And that's just a symbol of that happening. That's a, a symbol of us moving forward. 
Yeah, no, mm. that's absolutely right. Don't you think a Gigafactory... No. Sorry, go on. I was going to say that no one has talked about Gigafactories in the Middle East yet or Africa yet. I was, I was going to point that out next, yeah. <laughs> so I'm very under-informed on again in those two areas. So I wanted to actually hear from you, like if Tesla were to build a Gigafactory to serve these regions, where would be good candidates? In my opinion, um, it has to be Dubai. Um, let me tell you something about Kuwait. Kuwait, how they work is um, all the brands that come into Kuwait must come through a Kuwaiti company agency. So for example, um, Toyota that comes into Kuwait, um, on the local on Toyota, there's a Toyota logo, and at the bottom it shows who the agent is. Like as a, as, mm. a, as a, not a stamp, but as like those uh, symbols. So in, in Kuwait, they don't say that, oh, this is a Toyota car. This is uh, this company's car. And this is for everything, food products, cars, uh, electronics, everything. So it's, mm. it's very hard for, um, uh, nearly impossible actually, for companies to come in Kuwait and directly do it themselves. So they have to go through a third party. It's just how, it's just how it is. And in Kuwait, um, the, the agencies are fighting to get the um, dealership, to get the rights to sell in, in Kuwait, but they don't. Tesla is not accepting. They're not, they're not interested in actually giving the agency to someone else. They prefer them to come there and do it. But this is, this is, this is a big fight that's going on. But in terms of Gigafactory, I think best place at the moment would be in, in Dubai. Economic, it, it make, doing business there is absolutely easy, extremely easy. Mm. Anyone can do a business there. You can even own the land for 99 years if you want. So um, having a business there is absolutely a, um, a no-brainer at this point. Now, if you would say the best place for them to have it, I would say um, Iran would have been probably one of the best places to have a gigafactory. But because of what's going on there and, you know, there's no, um, they're not economic friendly and with mm. all attention and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not a good idea, but if it was a free nation and, and if it was open for foreign investment, man, Iran would have been probably one of the best places in the world to have gigafactory because population is young. Um, mm -hmm. they get lots of sun. They're, they're, they're a bridge between the middle East and Asia and it would have been the perfect spot. But um, aside from that, um, I think UAE, mainly in the Dubai region, is, is probably the best place for um, uh, Tesla to come and do a Gigafactory. And I honestly believe that they will eventually do this. I think they will, it's, it's why wouldn't they do it? Like it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's an export hub. Any container that comes to Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi, any of these countries, they have to stop in Dubai, get trans, you know, um, get transported to other ships that go to those countries. So good insight. Yeah. So definitely there hundred percent. Yes. And if they're going to build 10 more giga factories, yeah, there's going to be at least one in Middle East or Africa. Yeah. There's one, there's one big country that is left on this discussion and, and that's India. So yes. for those of us who follow yes. Tesla, we've all seen the news that Tesla's been trying to enter India. They've been trying to work the government. It's not successful yet. Other people also say that the addressable car market for Tesla right now isn't significant yet. So while the population is huge, they want to billion people. Yeah. Singapore sells more luxury cars defined by price range, you say, like BMW, Mercedes. More luxury cars in Singapore than India. And in Singapore only has 6 million people. <laughs> so until Tesla comes up with either full robot taxis or a more affordable option, I think it's it's not a deal breaker yet, they're not yet in India. Although there are many Tesla fans in India who really want Tesla to be here. But same can be said for most countries around the world. He's captured the imagination of not just adults, but even school children. Mm. Yep. Yep. No, India would be a, uh, I think India would be a good um, uh, counter to China's gigafactory. And uh, it's a massive market. Um, but I, I would see more um india would be a very good place to open a gigafactory and scale the compact car that they will come out in the next three four years that would be like like their own population would obviously you know if it's if it's if it's very affordable they'll pick that and then 
they can easily scale it in that country. So the India, um, India, India is one that they're going back and forth. I see it, and I think at one point they said they they stopped, but I think I think they haven't stopped. I think there's a lot of nagging and haggling going around that. Now, don't you think a gigafactory in Brazil is a possibility? Because I've been hearing a lot of rumors that a Brazil could be a place for that as well. I agree. Like this, the population is huge. The what we need is just really understand the address is what's the addressable market for Tesla's current products. So would Brazil be a better candidate as the last of the three 10 gigafactories when the product pipeline is ready for, for Brazil? Because if you will sell a Model 3, Model Y right now, what would be the total size of addressable market? I don't know. I don't have the answer. But that's just one, one factor. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Because but, every gigafactory is a product capacity of 1.5 to 2 million. Yeah. So are you able to at least locally sell within your region 1.5 to 2 million Teslas a year? And yeah. so if you need to wait for a while more for the right product, maybe that's okay. So maybe five years from now. Maybe, yeah. Brazil has a large population and the country next, uh, the, what, the country west of, yeah, west of Brazil, Chile, has a lot yeah. of minerals, has a lot of like lithium and all those things that need to make batteries. So yes. that's what got me interested. I'm like, okay. And I think that, I think when, when Elon visited Brazil's president, Brazil, I think earlier this year, he was, he was asking Elon if he could possibly uh, think of a gigafactory in Brazil. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so that's interesting. That's interesting. We'll see. Well, I, um, I think they're going to announce it in a couple of months or a few months. So that's going to be very interesting to see where and, yes. and how. So I'm very excited for that. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that, was, that was nice. Thanks for your input on that. Now, the last question here, and this is the one that um, is like, I, I left the last for the, the best for the last. I don't, I'm, not, well, I don't, I'm not too sure if it's the best, but it's the biggest concern. Um, it's the relation between... China and Taiwan, and then the U.S. And I'm just thinking what happened when, when, when Russia went into Ukraine. So many U.S. companies pulled out of Russia for good. I, I don't think they're ever going to go back unless there's a big regime change in Russia. If something like that happens, and let's say China decides to, you know, they can't reunify Taiwan peacefully, and now they want to take it by force. And if they go by force, the U.S. will intervene. And yeah. if they intervene, well, then guess what? Now you're at war with the U.S. and now the China. And, you know, it's, it's a big mess that, that will end up happening. But it's really hard to see this happen as well because the, China and U.S. are so dependent on each other that if any escalation goes, it's just bad for both of them. Um, I'm just thinking that mm. even if this a war does spark, what will happen to China to to Tesla Shanghai? Because that that's what scares me the most out of uh, out of Tesla as a, as an investor. It's like the biggest risk factor for me that could potentially happen. Hopefully not, knock on wood. But you know, <laughs> yeah, it will be a it will be a huge loss for for Tesla in the very very rare event that does happen. It'll be a very huge loss. I don't think a war is going to happen anytime soon again. Also, this for supply chain regions. So even if both sides don't like each other, right now China still relies on imports for like ninety five percent of their semiconductors. They are trying to build their own local semiconductor business, but it's on lower grade stuff like freight semiconductors mm -hmm. or seed semiconductors. Nothing really high tech yet. So if that happens, the entire economy would be in a very significant halt. So. The signals for when China is a leverage to credibly do that is when they've got a strong local semiconductor business, technology, supply chain. They're able to source their own semiconductors. There are no critical food or raw materials need the need for most of the world, or they could get it from friendly nations. And right now, they are, the, the, the military still needs time to strengthen. Like The, the US has a very combat-tested military. Mm. China has not fought in a major war in a very, very long time. That's true. And as you've seen from the Ukraine conflict recently, <laughs> even a battle-tested military, if it's not well run, 
it's very hard as well. So it's the odds, the odds are not in favor right now. If the smartest thing for China to do is just to signal strength, to get US to respect the signal of strength, maintain the status quo, and both sides grow on the bound. And, and pray hopefully in yeah. five, 10 years from now, the right leaders are in place. Because normal people, like there was a YouTube channel, Asian Boss, they talked to like normal yeah. Taiwanese, uh, normal folks in, in Shanghai. A lot of people, they really just want to have a good time with the neighbors, make sure everyone's doing okay, yeah. your, your family is thriving. We don't need to fight. Yeah, there's no need. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There are, there are a lot of Russian troops who don't want to go to Ukraine and fight as well. You've all seen the news as well. Yep. They have a lot of friends and family in, in both countries. So I, I think leadership plays a very big part. That's like how we talked about. You shared your examples with uh, Kuwait, Dubai, Singapore has demonstrated good, great leadership many times. Sometimes they miss things. I think leadership plays such a big, big role in how things move forward. Yeah, I mean, let's let's hope um, it doesn't it doesn't um, you know escalate ever and you know you know he said cross your fingers it doesn't happen. Um, if you if you play out that that extreme scenario, what's going to happen in all of these companies is say World War Two, car companies started making tanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. If that if that if it goes to that extent, then you can see Tesla mm-hmm. making tanks, probably electric tanks, <laughs> and actually. I feel right, it's a point of no return where you don't want to fight the US now because, especially like two superpowers, the reason is how, who has the most satellites in space right now? Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. The US does. Starlink has about 4,000 satellites. They can completely eliminate anything in space that is not US or US friendly. That's true. Every satellite has a little bit of propulsion. You can turn it to a missile. 4,000 missiles in space. Starship launches 120 per day, per flight, yeah, that's, per flight, yeah, that's crazy. per flight, not even per day, per flight, <laughs> four flights a day. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. What is Starship if you put a, a warhead on top? What is a Falcon 9 if you put a warhead on top? Yep. It is insane to, to do that. It's not constructive for the world, but if that rare situation happens, I feel because of where especially SpaceX is, it doesn't play out well for anyone else on the other side. How is because I know China is, is um, China got really upset when when Nancy went to to Taiwan recently. Yeah. Um, how, how is the um, how the conflict that's happening right now around Taiwan with all the drills and the stuff they're doing? How is that affecting Singapore or any other South East Asian countries, or is it just like ah okay, this is gonna blow over? For Southeast Asia, because they. They rely on both sides, being neutral to both sides. That's very, very important. Singapore can't fight anyone. So it's very important that we're neutral to both sides. There are some small practical implications. So it's some Singapore Airlines flights that were supposed to fly to Taipei, uh, those flights are to be rerouted because they're military drills right now by, by China. But from day to day, practical implication, I think the stance is just be, uh, be careful, be neutral, do our best to be a conduit for both sides. I see. To be a neutral ground for both sides. So actually this even plays out in business as well. When you think about Southeast Asia, it's right now like a business battleground between the Eastern tech companies like Alibaba, Tencent, and the Western tech companies like Amazon. Mm. It's much harder for Alibaba, Tencent to, to work without hindrance in Western Europe and US. So Southeast Asia is really a neutral ground for, for business for politics and more. And it was actually very controversial when Singapore, Singapore's government officially uh, supported Ukraine. Oh, really? In the, like, wow. Sanctions, yes. It was the only Southeast Asia country to do that. Wow. And actually many Singaporeans also said like, why are you doing that? So yeah, wow. broadly in Southeast Asia, trying to be as neutral as possible because the cost of not being neutral is too high. Mm. Yeah. It's too high. Yeah. Huh. Wow, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Wow. Okay. Well, um, that's all the questions, man. I mean, those that, that was a that was a that was a good answer, man. That was a a very nice answer. I I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, 
I appreciate you, man, coming on to this channel. I really do. Yeah, no, we covered everything. Yeah, man, we covered everything from head to toe. And uh, time is time is amazing. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, guys. I'm telling you, if you guys want more insight into Tesla, even Apple, sometimes um, check out his channel. Card is in the cor link in the corner and in the description. I highly recommend you go subscribe. I'm a subscriber and I do watch his videos. Extremely interesting, man. Like I love the fact that you have like you take your camera in the city and then you go to different parts of the city. Like I, I just love that. I love that a lot. Like, Thank I'm you. just like, that's really cool. That's the, like, no one's, no one has ever done that. So I'm like, that's, that's awesome. So I highly recommend you guys to go ahead and um, check out his videos and subscribe, give him some love. And um, Darren, I hope to see you um, more often on this channel. And um, it was a pleasure, man. It was a pleasure to host you, man. It's been a joy to be here. Great conversation. The, the, the the more we learn, the more we realize how much more we have to learn. Oh, yeah. And I'm thankful for this. Yeah, I learned a lot, man. Some of the points that you pointed out, um, I'm sure my viewers really appreciate it. I'm sure they had some eye-opening moments too, like I had during this conversation. Um, yeah, man, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you for accepting my invite. And um, I hope to, um, I hope to uh, um, have you more on this channel. Likewise. Awesome. Let me know if you visit Singapore. I'll, I'll be in LA in the US next month. So if you pass by, let me know as well. Yeah, no, definitely. I'll be, I'll be in Canada in a, in a week time from this video. So um, you would, uh, if you decide to ever come to Toronto and if I'm there, yeah, we can, we can definitely rent out a nice Model X, Model S, Y, whatever it is, you know, and uh, we can, we can, you know, enjoy man we can do whatever yeah <laughs> sounds good awesome thanks a lot man take care see you